All right, thank you. So, welcome everybody to my talk about reverse engineering Minecraft RNG to get world records. Starting off, first, who am I? Uh, I'm Jure Groenendijk, a 19-year-old, been a little bit of a wait with Corona, but 19-year-old um, college student studying computer science and engineering uh, at the TU Delft. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, and I'm currently the owner of the biggest Minecraft co-op speedrunning um, server in the world on Discord. Um, we currently hold between 40 and 70 world records. Um, yeah, that's it about me. But before I get started, first some terminology and starting info, because I assume some people in the audience know exactly what half of those words mean. So um, what is speedrunning? Speedrunning is the art of trying to finish a game as fast as possible. Um, within speedrunning, there are some other terms like PB, which is a personal best, um, and WR, world record, which is the fastest time anyone has ever beat it so far. Then what is Minecraft? Um, a lot of us have probably grown up with it, but for the people who don't know, Minecraft is a sandbox, um, yeah, building, mining, crafting game. So it's kind of like an MMORPG where you just go around you you can mine stuff you can craft stuff like the name implies but there's also combat there's um mobs loot dungeons everything um within minecraft there's a few things that you can do for speed running so there's uh, the categories relevant to us today are uh any percent which is just beating the game which i will get back to in a bit and minor chunk which is where you take a 16 by 16 area and mine the entire thing out. Um, within these categories, there's also subcategories, namely random C glitchless, where you create a random world, you have no idea what you're doing, and you just go in. And set C glitchless, where, where you get a world that you have already chosen uh, beforehand, and you, you know exactly where everything is, and you just go in and do everything as fast as possible. There's also, for the any percent category, there's also filtered C glitchless, which is where you get a world that you have never seen before, but it is guaranteed to have the features like the villages and uh, the portals and stuff in the right place. I talked about beating the game, but what exactly does that entail? So there is three dimensions within Minecraft uh, as of right now. You have the overworld, which is where you spawn and where you, yeah, where you start out, run around. Um, then eventually you will make a nether portal, which will bring you to the nether, which is the second dimension here. Um, and then last but not least, you go back to the overworld, and then when you find the stronghold, you can go to the end. And within the end, third dimension here, you can beat the Ender Dragon, and then when you kill the Ender Dragon, you go into the portal, um, you have beaten the game. To get there, there are a few steps you need to go. You can't just run to the portal, jump in, and be done with it. So, to actually get to the portal and enter it, you need Blaze Rods. So which you can get from blazes within the nether, which are the top creatures, and ender, uh, ender pearls, which you get from endermen, which are the bottom creature. Together, you can combine those, and they make an uh, eyes of ender, which will point towards the stronghold. And when you get to the stronghold, you can go to the end and beat the game. This is a very crucial part about, um, yeah, about speedrunning. How do you find the stronghold? So the issue with finding a stronghold is that when you throw a pearl, it will point you towards the stronghold, but that's just a straight line, and it still is really hard to find it. So the trick that I'm going to be talking about today, or one of the tricks, is this. There are fossils in the nether, and by looking at the position of the fossil, you can actually find the location of the stronghold without throwing, or well, by well, drastically reducing the amount of pearls thrown. When you actually get to the end, uh, you can use a little trick where beds blow up if you sleep in them. And by clicking on the bed on the exact uh, the right timing, you can kill the ender dragon just by sleeping in a bed while it is above you. Um, this is known as four bedding, or five bedding if you're worse at it, or six bedding like me. Um, but yeah, this is just a little Easter egg that just turned into one of the most important um, mechanics within Minecraft speedrunning. Um, there's also some version differences when it comes to speedrunning. Um, namely, pre-1.9, so before version 1.9, um, 
you had to actually kill Endermen for the Enderpearls. Between 1.9 and 1.15, villages, uh, villagers got added and actually made decent for trading. So there, instead of killing Ender, uh, Endermen for the Pearls, you actually um, traded with villagers. And then in 116 plus, which is the version that, um, that I'm talking about now, or that mo is most relevant to speedrunners today, is you actually go to a bastion uh, within the nether and you trade, you barter with the piglins there to get pearls. And I think the last bit of terminology about minor chunk, uh, where as I said, you take a 16 by 16 area and you just completely mine it out. This is footage from one of our world records and you can just see a bunch of us just happily mining away with our group. Um, yeah, and as you can see on the left, that's a 60 by 16 area or a chunk. And that's the, yeah, you start with a full one and you just go, and it's empty. Um, all right, now to go into my journey as a speedrunner. So it started out when um, I was in university and I had a little bit of a disagreement about how they taught things. So within the university discord, I said, hey, Everybody, at everyone, um, I'm going to give a mini workshop on assembly. Uh, we have to do an assembly assignment for this end of this week, so we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to be in the Discord. Y'all can join if you want. I don't I don't mind. Um, and that, that went on. I did that for about four hours, and then halfway through, I got a message saying, "Hey, uh, hey, Jure, we're at 150 people, and we cannot fit any more in the Discord." So then my brother had to live stream my Discord to Twitch to get everyone in there. And from that, I had a little bit of a following on, yeah, within the university class of computer science engineering cohort 20, uh, 2020, 2021. So, um, yeah, w uh, one fateful evening after we were done with some of our exams, um, we actually thought, you know what? We have a bunch of people in here. Let's just do a Minecraft speed run. Um, within the speedrunning categories, there's like you can do it solo, you can do it with two people, three to four, five to nine, or ten plus. And since 1.16 just released, and we did it with more than ten people, or exactly ten, we were the very first person, the very first group to actually get or to actually complete this category, and therefore we got a world record. Um, that was my, that was my introduction to speedrunning, and we were like, whoa. This is free. We can get a lot of these. So I made a separate Discord. Um, I invited a bunch of other speedrunners. And, uh, well, that grew out to be still the Discord that I use today for uh, for my co-op speedruns. Um, and then about a few months later, once we were, you know, uh, we were a little bit burnt out on all the normal any percent speedrunning, we started thinking about minor chunk. And we started doing minor chunk runs. And our minor chunk runs were decent but then we started to get into minor chunk ssg or set c glitchless it's time to get technical first off i want to give a big shout out to these two people on the left here we have neil i put a little crown on his, on his uh, profile picture because he's a fucking king this guy together with captain woodtex set up the minecraft seed finding libraries that we and most other minecraft seed finders use today and it has been amazing. And also, this is Denry uh, on the right side, who actually has a um, who actually helped me and the other people with it, within this project figure out how ravines work within Minecraft. All right. So Minecraft randomness. Minecraft uh, when you create a world, you can enter a seed. You can enter letters as well, but that just turns it into numbers, and it just basically ma always makes it a 64-bit number. Uh, that 64-bit number consists out of two parts: the structure seed, which is the left, for, uh, the rightmost 48 bits, and the biome seed, which is the leftmost 16 bits. Worlds with the same structure seed will have the exact same structures, so villages, um, portal location, ravine, everything else like that will always be the same if a seed has the same structure seed. We call those seeds sister seeds. Then you also have the biome sheets, and those those bits get used for generation of biomes, terrain, mountains, everything like that. So say you have a, a seat which has very good uh, location of the structure, but you know there's a giant hill in the middle of everything. You can use uh, you can just make the biome sheet something different while keeping the structure sheet the same, and you can get something else. All right. As I mentioned earlier, Neil made this amazing library called Feature Utils. 
And feature utils is amazing. Before this existed, we had to launch a Minecraft world, hope it was a good seed, and try to see if we could find something decent. And that would take hours. No, it would take... We, ha we would have, like, tens, hundreds of people trying to reset to find a good seed for any percent or mine a chunk or anything, really. But now, with, with the feature utils, you can just say, okay, create a world for 116.1 with this seed and tell me, uh, tell me the location of the four villages in these regions. And it would just print it out to the console. It would simulate the random calls and it would give the output. And then suddenly, instead of this taking, I don't know, a minute, it takes less than, say what, 10 milliseconds to figure out the location of four villages in any seed. It's changed everything. We were suddenly able to automate and program everything that we needed for seed, uh, seed finding. Well, not everything. I'll get to that later. These are ravines. Ravines are extremely useful for minor chunk runners. Because as you can see, that is a lot of blocks that are not there. It's a big gap in the world. But if you're doing minor chunk, and this ravine goes through the middle of a chunk, then suddenly you can cut away, well, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 blocks just straight up out of your chunk. That drastically reduces the amount of time you need to mine. So they're a gold mine, and we started digging. This is the code that then resent to me about uh, ravines. So you could pass a, a random object. It would do some stuff with the um, with the position of the chunk, and it would say, "Hey, is there a um, is there a ravine here? Yes or no." This was huge. This means for any chunk in the world, for any world, we can tell if they're a ravine or not. By just programming, by just coding, by just doing some Java fucky wucky. It's, it's amazing. Not only that, this code also contained the X, Y, and Z offset. So within the chunk, so within the 16 by 16 area, you also saw the exact tile or the exact block where it would, uh, yeah, it would generate. But also the yaw pitch, and more importantly, width. We could use, uh, we could find the width of the ravines that spawned, the direction they spawned in, and whether or not they spawned. This was amazing. So, we started coding. We had, um, we did a bunch of stuff just in pure Java, with just our own code and Neil's code and Dunry's code. And we made a program that multi-threaded went through all the seeds and tried to look, okay, can I find one ravine that is decently wide, another ravine that is decently wide? Do they intersect somewhere and, you know, close enough so that it's actually useful? And if so, can we get some nice structure seeds so that, or not from nice world seeds so that it is actually close to spawn? So here we combine all our knowledge so far, you know, the structure seeds where you would get the ravines, the world seeds where the spawn location change, and it would give us a bunch of seeds together with the location where they intersected. But this was still a lot of seeds. We had thousands, if not tens of thousands of seeds to manually check and see how many blocks are here, is this a good spawn, is this decent, you know, it was a lot of work. Then we went on to part two, the seed checker. So what uh, what Gala and Utros, two people within our group, actually did is they made a um, they made a script that would straight up call Minecraft code in Java. It would create a world, and it would, um, as you can see here, it would call check world. And what check world would do is it would take the world and it would see okay how many blocks are in here, and yeah, that's it. It would go through every chunk, through every 16 by 16 area around the, around the ravine, and it would see, okay, what's the best 16 by 16 area that we can find? And this will be an output, for example. For C380, blah, 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 we have a chunk that only has 4,000 blocks within, uh, with x, uh, x coordinate 35 and z coordinate minus 15. This is amazing. <laughs> We found this with it. So there's a 16 by 16 area here. 
that is intersected by five different ravines, at least from what we can tell, all going towards the same point in the middle here. This got rid of a lot of blocks. And just to illustrate how many blocks got rid of, uh, it got rid of, this is it, side by side, to a normal Minecraft chunk. Approximately 16,000 blocks, compared to our chunk. Uh, 3,687 blocks. This was an enormous improvement for mine and chunk across the board. Set seed, run, or well, set seed uh, solo, set seed co-op, set seed quads, set seed 5 to 9, set seed 10 plus, shattered within a week. It ended up giving us this record. Four minutes and 13 seconds. That is how long it took to mine out an entire chunk in Minecraft. That is less than a third of the time that I've been talking so far. This shattered everything. But you can ask yourself, how? How do we figure this all out? So, as I said before, Neil is a king, a god. An absolute shad within the world of Minecraft. Or at least within Minecraft speedrunning. Um, within Neil's server, we found uh, he made this. Which, I, I used the, the second one, the decompiler MC. But these are all ways that you can actually look at uh, Minecraft code. And you can use mappings, different mappings, and you can just see what it says and how it works. Decompile it, have a look at, how, uh, have a look at it. Side note, it is an absolute mess. <laughs> Trying to understand this stuff is very tricky, and sometimes you'll just spend like, and like three, four, five, six hours, to, up to days, looking at a piece of code trying to figure out what is it doing and how is it doing it just because you want to make sure a chest spawns instead of being overridden by air for example but now that we can read minecraft code we can see this this is the code for ravines that um that then we found in um in minecraft code it's actually called canyons instead of ravines and this is the official version of it so at the top you can see the is random the next float is less than 0 0.02. Um, which basically is, you know, does the ravine spawn here? And if it does, then it calls a car function. And then it will give you the x, y, and z coordinate, which are d, d2, and d3. It'll give you the yaw and width uh, and pitch, which are f, f2, and f3. And it will give the length, which is n7. So it is definitely not legible. <laughs> But if you do a bit of research, try to figure out what what uh, what goes where and what the variable names actually mean, you can figure out what this all does. So, back to the neat trick. Strongholds. Strongholds are procedurally generated in rings. There are nine rings in total, I think. And um, these rings generate around zero, zero. Um, and for example, in the first ring, there will be three strongholds within 1,200 and 2,800 blocks from spawn. Second ring is between 4,000 and, uh, and 6,000. There's six, uh, six strongholds, etc., etc., etc. We don't care. When you're speedrunning, you want to be as fast as possible, and having to travel all the way to a second ring stronghold, no way. Nobody does that. We only care about this first ring. Uh, which is good, because it limits the choices for us, and it also makes the programming a lot easier. So there's a few types that you can do to actually find the stronghold. So as I said, when you throw an enderpearl, it uh, gives you an arrow straight towards where the um, where the stronghold will be. So here is an example of how you would travel to it. So you would throw a pearl, travel approximately that way, you know, throw, go off, throw another one, see how far they are apart, see what the angle distance is, um, and just go all the way until it's really close, then Go 90 degrees off your path and throw another one, and you can triangulate it using the two, yeah, two skew points, and then you found the stronghold. This takes a long time. This is a lot of walking. So what people have figured out is um, an important note here. Within the Nether, so that second dimension I was talking about, every single block you travel actually equates to eight blocks in the overworld. So when you um, when you go into the nether and you travel 100 blocks or 200 blocks, that in the overall actually 800 or 1600 blocks. That cuts your time by eight, you know, logically. So what people started doing is they went into the into the nether, tried to find their uh, their fortress and bastion to get the blaze rods and pearls, and then instead of traveling all the way back, going out 
and then traveling all the way to the to the fortress or to the um, to the stronghold, what they would do is they would go to approximately a place that would bring you to the ring, place a portal, and pray. Hope that you get close to the stronghold. In some documented cases, people just randomly pray, place their portal and got put right smack dab in the center of the stronghold, like a few rooms away from the portal room. Um, this was the meta for a while. It actually still is the meta because any other me method takes a little bit longer, but it also really inconsistent. Like if you have a good blind, you can be in the portal 200 blocks away, but if you have a bad blind, you can be up to 1300 blocks away and that's still really, really bad. If you have to go out, walk all that distance, you know, your run's dead. So what people started doing is doing estimated travel where they would leave the portal, throw a single pearl, see, okay, it's in this direction, then go back to the nether, travel a few blocks or a few hundred blocks or whatever, and then make another portal and hope they're closer. Uh, then there's another one, which is calculated travel, which is where you would take two pearls and uh, you would very carefully note down the coordinates and the angle of the intersection and hope, you know, see if it, see if it works. Um, and then put it into a calculator. And because you have two lines, they will eventually meet somewhere and you can actually calculate where the stronghold will be. But then, one fateful day, Matthew did a, and I quote, hacking invent of a threat. <laughs> divine travel. People were calling this, this because it simply looked divine, made by the gods. There's no way this could make sense, but somehow it does. To explain what this is, I need to get into the different kinds of random that Minecraft uses. So Minecraft random object, chunk run, uses a set seed, like just any other random object. You can say, okay, this is the seed, and then all the random numbers that come from it will always be the same. If you say set seed one, next number will be five. If you do it somewhere else in the other side of the world, set seed one, next number will still be five. They also have a thing called set carver seed, which you can use to get a specific random number for every chunk. So it will be different per world seed, per chunk, but it will always be the same for that chunk for that world. And then there's also set terrain seed, population seed, decorated seed, feature seed. There's a bunch of other stuff, but we will not be going into that now. We just have to look at set carver seed. Set carver seed takes the world seed, um, puts that on the random object. This is within the random object. Uh, creates two next longs, multiplies those by the chunk A and chunk Z, and then XORs those two numbers with the world seed, and then sets that as the seed. That's like the actual seed that gets used for the random thing. This sounds really complex, but what Matthew figured out is that if you put the chunk X and chunk Z at exactly zero, so if you're within the chunk zero, zero, then the actual final calculation, this one for seed, will be zero times something, XOR zero times something, XOR world seed, or just world seed. So what a set carver seed call at chunk 00, zero does is exactly the same as just setting the seed to the world seed. That is the most important thing to take away from here. And if you look at the codes for fossils, which are those things I showed before, um, it, it, it calls the set carver seed with the structure seed and then the chunk X, chunk, chunk Z, and then it does a random call. Again, at chunk zero, 00, that will just be the same as saying set seed, world seed. For the ravines, it does the exact same thing. There's a plus one here, but that's, that's semantics. You can ignore that. Uh, that also has the same effect as just setting it to the world seed. And as you can see, the codes for the strongholds, the generation of the stronghold, and like the placement for those three strongholds within the ring is setting the seed to the world seed. And then it calls the next double, which gives the random number between zero and one, and multiplies that by um, by two pi to get an uh, an angle within the in radians within the circle. So, by looking at the x coordinate of a fossil at chunk zero zero, you can directly map that to the angle of the stronghold within the first ring, and also the second and the third stronghold because they're always equally spaced apart. So you can add uh, a circle divided by three, and it will be like you know, one here, one here, one here. So they will be equally spaced apart. Same work for ravines. However, that is a little less consistent, but it's also something that I found out. At zero, zero, if a ravine spawns, we know that the angle will be less than 0 0.02. This is amazing. 
this gives us a way to look where the throne is without throwing any pearls whatsoever. And people started making charts for it. So, um, yeah, if you find a fossil with x coordinate zero, then your first divine location is in a nether 25150. And people started using this. Many of these charts started popping up. And by God, did it work. Because a few weeks later, this run was had by Brent Dilda. Nine minutes and 38 seconds by using Divine Travel. You can see here, uh, he paused the game, looks at the, um, looks at the fossil, and the fossil is at, let's see, Expedition 8 within Chunk 00, which you can see here, but it's a little bit illegible, but it's Expedition 8. So he went to the chart, looked up for Expedition 8, and made a portal somewhere close to those coordinates. And he spawned right in the middle of the stronghold. No enderpearl thrown, no triangulation, no calculated travel, straight up divine travel. Straight went in there and shattered the world record. Second place, or first place before the run, with 11 minutes and 7 seconds in game time. This guy didn't cut off a minute. Not a minute, 15 seconds. He got off one and a half minutes from the time. He shattered the 11 minute barrier. He shattered the 10 minute 30 barrier. He shattered the 10 minute barrier. He shattered 945 and went straight for the 936. That's my talk. I want to give a quick shout out to Neil and Captain Woodax for making the, um, making the libraries. K4Y4 for adding me to the Threaten Routing Discord where most of this was discussed. Matthew Boland for actually inventing divine travel and being one of the smartest people within Minecraft seed finding community. Leila, close of which, for helping me with um, with a bunch of stuff and also just being generally all, all around amazing within the community. This is Denry for helping me with the um, with the uh, ravine code. Colin Utrell for making the seed checker, and my brother Yella for uh, helping me out with all of these projects. Thank you.